Hello, I'm John Kelly, group leader of Citizens Climate Lobby Santa Barbara chapter. I'm an architect and longtime advocate for green building and sustainable communities. I joined CCL because I want my grandson's generation to inherit a livable world. Thanks for being concerned about climate change. You are not alone. Polling shows there is broad popular support for decisive climate action. Our US climate envoy, John Kerry says, this is the year for climate action. Today, we will tell you about Citizens Climate Lobby and share a brief report on the current status of our climate. Then we will use a global climate modeling tool to show you a feasible path to maintain a livable world. We will also provide details about current legislation and perspectives about carbon pricing policy. And we will tell you how to join the effort to heal our climate. Recently, a friend introduced me to a book called The Ministry for the Future by the notable science fiction author, Kim Stanley Robinson. In this novel, the parties to the Paris Climate Agreement establish an international agency to advocate for the well being of the world's future generations. It is called the Ministry for the Future. The purpose of today's presentation is similar to Robinson's narrative. We want to create a shared understanding of the current status of our climate, which climate policy solutions are most effective, and how you can advocate for these policies. Let's all become ministers for the future. Now, Carol Switzer will introduce you to CCL. Carol is a grandmother and former teacher who wants to leave a healthy and beautiful home for all living things. Carol? Thank you, John. I'll start by introducing you to Citizens Climate Lobby, kind of an overview and how I got involved and how Citizens Climate Lobby got started. We are a nonpartisan, nonprofit, volunteer organization focused on lowering climate emissions through uh, the carbon emissions through national legislation. You're looking at volunteers in Washington, DC, getting ready to go in and meet and lobby their uh, members of Congress or their senators. The founder of Citizens Climate Lobby is the late Marshall Saunders, who is a retired businessman he, uh, Marshall Saunders was working on a micro lending project in Mexico uh, when he saw Al Gore's movie, An Inconvenient Truth. At that time, he realized that the work he was doing to help people would all be undone unless climate change could be brought under control. So he turned his attention to, to uh, climate change at that point. And he thought national legislation was needed but how could that happen when our lawmakers were so influenced by powerful business interests and didn't want change? So Saunders' vision was to empower people to reclaim their democracy. In 2007, he started with a meeting of 27 people. He wasn't sure quite how to, where to go with it, but he made his way because today CCL has 190,000 members in more than 600 chapters. Six years later, 2013, I had recently retired from teaching and I was looking for a way to help with the climate crisis. I had a young grandson, Leo. I have three now, but at that time I had one and I could not stand by and watch while we drifted toward the devastation of our environment, of the environment he would inherit and there was another factor um, in my desiring to be part of this movement. As I was growing up, my father worked for Standard Oil of California. Because the fossil fuel industry had supported our family, I felt, and, and I knew now that it was a threat to the environment, I felt even more responsible to be part of the solution. And at that same time, other members of the Unitarian Society were looking for ways to be active in protecting the environment. When Becca Clausen heard about CCL, 
She arranged for a chapter startup meeting in Blake Lounge. This is 2013. This was the opportunity I was looking for. I joined and started learning, writing letters, meeting with community leaders, making presentations, and lobbying our members of Congress, first Lois Capps, and then Salud Carbajal. Along the way, I met like-minded people and made friends. The group you see on the left is gathered to participate in our monthly nationwide CCL Zoom meeting in Blake Lounge. Yes, it was Zoom, but we Zoomed onto a big screen, but we gathered together uh, in our local communities to be part of it. Um, that, was, that was then. And we are so grateful to the Unitarian Society of Santa Barbara for providing this space for us, for our meetings and for our community outreach. Now we have about two dozen active members of CCL with a mailing list of about 400. On the right, you see a screenshot of a recent Zoom lobby meeting with Congressman Carbajal. He's down in the lower right. This picture shows a lobby meeting with Salute in his DC office. The 24th United States Congressional District in California includes Santa Barbara and San Luis Obispo counties and a portion of Ventura County. We joined CCL members from other chapters in the district to meet with our member of Congress or, or their staff at least four times a year, twice in DC and, and uh, to keep in touch throughout the year. Everyone has a stake in a healthy planet because caring for the environment should not be a partisan issue. CCL is nonpartisan. We lobby our members of Congress and senators regardless of their party affiliation. In our efforts to influence Congress, CCL builds relationships based on respect and finding common ground. So what are we lobbying for? CCL promotes a carbon pricing policy we call carbon fee and dividend. Carbon fee and dividend puts a fee on carbon fuels like coal, oil, and gas starting at $15 a ton and rising steeply by at least $10 a year. As the price of carbon fuels goes up, the market shifts toward clean energy, shifts away from the carbon fuels. That's the carbon fee. Also, the money collected from the fee is paid in equal shares every month to American families. That's the dividend. And finally, there's a border trade adjustment that evens the playing field for American businesses. You'll hear more about this in a few minutes. So why do we promote carbon fee and dividend? The growing price on carbon fuels is the fastest and most effective way to lower emissions. It'll clean our air and our water and stabilize our climate and oceans. It'll improve health and save lives. So I've outlined for you what Citizens Climate Lobby is and the policy we promote, carbon fee and dividend. You'll hear more later about our policy and about legislation. Now, Carl Hutterer will share a status report on the climate crisis. Carl is a former director of the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History and an advisor for the Community Environmental Council. Carl? Thank you, John. For most of human history, the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere were below 300 parts per million. And then we began burning fossil fuels. The concentrations rose. And 40 years ago, scientists told us that these concentrations should be kept below 350 parts per million in order to avoid excessive warming that would destabilize our global climates. <clears throat> we blew past that point 10 years later. At the end of February of this year, measurements taken at the observatory on Mauna Loa volcano in Hawaii recorded 418 parts per million. As greenhouse gases rose, so did global temperatures. Global mean temperatures have increased as well, 
to, to uh, 2020 was the hottest year on record with average global temperatures nearly 1.3 degrees centigrades or 2.3 degrees Fahrenheit above pre-industrial average. Scientists consider an increase of 1.5 degrees centigrade as a ceiling for maintaining a manageable climate. With an increase of two degrees centigrade approaching catastrophic levels, we're inching ever closer to that ceiling. The fever the earth has caught has consequences. And we're all familiar with those consequences. We, we don't need the statistics here because we know the mega fires, the mega droughts, the mega storms, the mega floods that we have all been experiencing already. We know we are on an accelerating train and the economic costs and the costs of human lives and human health are enormous and growing. Economically alone, climate risks are becoming increasingly uninsurable. Many new people alive today, including my grandchildren, I hope, will still be around by the end of this century. What world will they inherit if we continue with business as usual? Forecasting future temperatures is difficult, of course, mostly because of factors relating to human behavior, but the broad outlines are clear. Scientists agree that if we continue along the course we are on right now, temperatures in 2100 will be about four degrees centigrade higher than in 1900, and perhaps as much as eight degrees centigrade. This would be 14 degrees Fahrenheit. <clears throat> Even a four degrees centigrade warming would be absolutely catastrophic. The international agreement that was reached in Paris in 2015, the famous COP21, was hailed as a major international breakthrough, and in many regards it was. However, it was also universally acknowledged even then and by the participants themselves that the voluntary commitments to climate action made by each nation fell far short of what actually was needed. It was the hope that future progress would be made in coming years. So now, five years later, what's the scorecard? Here's the scorecard. There's not a single country in the world that could be considered a role model. There are two small countries, tiny countries, that have, uh, that, uh, have action that is compatible with 1.5 degrees centigrade warming. There are a few countries that have action that is compatible with a two degree centigrade warming, Bhutan, Costa Rica, Ethiopia, and so on. Then all the other countries in the world I engage in action is either insufficient, highly insufficient, or critically insufficient. Among the critically insufficient countries are Russia, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, United States of America, and Ukraine. So how big a mountain do we have to climb? And how quickly do we have to get to the top in order to avoid disaster? <clears throat> if we want our grandchildren to inherit a livable world, the job is huge, no question. And we have to accomplish it in unprecedented short period of time. We must decarbonize our generated energy. This is electricity. That is no more electricity generated with <clears throat> with uh, coal, oil, or uh, gas by 2035. We must decarbonize our transportation by 2035 that these no more gasoline powered cars. By 2050, we have to decarbonize heavy transportation, buses, trucks, uh, airplanes, ships, and so forth, trains. And we have to decarbonize the manufacture of coal, of steel and cement to heavy uh, greenhouse gas producers on central to our economy and technology. And we have hardly begun working on that. We have to convert agriculture 
from a large greenhouse gas producer that uh, produces about 28% of global greenhouse gases every year to a carbon sink. So we have to really reverse that issue. And we have to stop and reverse deforestation of tropical rainforests and expand forest cover in the rest of the world. All of this adds up to an absolute gigantic task. And the question is, can we, can we do it? Can it be done? The technologies definitely exist, but we can get it done only if we all work together and only if our individual efforts <clears throat> are guided, supported and enhanced by strong national and international policies. So what are those policies that we need to help us in this? Now, Stan Roden will demonstrate a global policy scenario that would preserve a livable planet. Stan volunteers for CCL because he cannot and will not leave an unlivable planet for his seven grandchildren and their children. Stan? Thank you, John. As Carl pointed out, this is clearly a global problem. You all know the story of the three blind men and the elephant. Each can only feel a part at whatever the large something is that's in front of them. They have an impossible time figuring it out. This is similar to the scope of a global climate crisis problem. It cannot be solved. That is, we cannot keep the planet from warming above 1.5 degrees centigrade without looking at and solving the problem from a global perspective. To look at it from a global perspective, MIT took up a challenge 15 years ago with system dynamics and climate science world-class experts like John Stearman shown in this image. MIT developed the En-ROAD simulator that anyone can use on any computer. It's an amazing technological breakthrough. En-ROAD shows us what an unlivable planet will look like. By the end of the century, at the global level, we are on track to see warming by 3.6 degrees centigrade, a whopping 6.6 .6 degrees Fahrenheit. This is a far cry from the 1.5 degree maximum rise recommended by the UNIPCC reports. Well, where are we now? In 2021, we are already at 1.27 degrees of warming. Many of you know areas of the world, including some places in the US, that today have seen average temperature rises that far exceed 1.5 degrees. For me, this graph illustrates better than any other why this is truly an immediate crisis. On the global level, the most obvious policy choice is to keep coal on the ground, right? You might think that by highly taxing coal globally, this would alone solve the problem. As you can see, it does make a difference, but a difference of about two tenths of a degree. It's nothing to sneer at. It's surely part of an effective solution, but standing alone, it is not the solution that we need. Population growth and economic growth will have a direct effect on the problem. Let's leave these as projected by MIT. That's a planet supporting 10.9 billion people by 2100, up from 7.8 today, and economic growth at approximately 1.5% of global GDP per person. Many believe that the solution lies with the greater use of renewables and electrification of our transportation and building sectors. Yes, we have made substantial scientific and economic improvements in these categories, especially in the US, Canada, and the EU. Modest adjustments on the simulator shown here at the global level indeed bring us modest gains. This keeps temperature rise to about three degrees. But even more aggressive enhanced global efforts with these changes provide a future rise to 2.7 degrees. An improvement, of course, but still not acceptable by any stretch. Like coal, it's not the solution. Let's look at additional global policy and action changes and see how they interact. We know we have to substantially reduce methane emissions, the most dangerous of the greenhouse gases, 
and change our land use policies, leaving more trees in the ground and planting more trees. And also let's include modest achievements going forward in carbon sequestration and removal. Result, at the global level, we achieve a nice reduction in the rise of global warming. These modest changes in combination will drive temperature rise below two degrees. Better, yes, but still short of where we need to be. Well, what about market incentives? Let's add on a gradual increase in a carbon tax, that is direct taxation at the source of coal, oil, and natural gas. This will clearly make a difference. Cumulatively at the global level, this gets us to our 1.5 degree goal. So yes, it is feasible. But what if we look at a very aggressive carbon tax all by itself? You can see that standing alone, this has a large positive impact, keeping temperatures nine tenths of a degree lower than the projected future. But again, you can also see it is not the solution. So what do we hope you will take away from today? There is no single solution to this existential crisis, either at the national or global levels. Only multiple strategies working in tandem will keep us safe from this greatest of all existential threats to our planet. Our job then is to create the political will for a livable planet. And one other takeaway, a carbon tax coupled with an environmentally just dividend must be part of any effective policy combinations. You can prove this to yourself on your own computer with the simulator. Thank you. Now, Carlo Broderick will present details of a proposed carbon fee and dividend bill. Carlo is a program coordinator at UCSB. Carlo? Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Carlo Broderick. Uh, and uh, we've all heard that Citizens Climate Lobby has a policy solution to climate change. Uh, and I'm here to dig into that policy solution a little bit more. But before I do, I want to tell you a little bit about myself and why I'm here. So I'm here because I am a Californian. I grew up in Modesto uh, and I moved to Santa Cruz for university. And now I live here in Santa Barbara uh, for work. All the places I've lived have had trouble with climate change, uh, water, heat, sea level rise. Uh, and everywhere I've lived has had a different political climate as well. Uh, Modesto is very conservative and Santa Cruz is very liberal. Now, Citizen Climate Lobby has a policy solution that addresses climate change in all of these places. And it also works politically in all of these places. And that's why I'm here and that's why you should be interested. So the policy we're talking about today is the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, HR 2307. So uh, this has recently be, been introduced in the House uh, by almost 30 sponsors. Now, CCL works with these representatives every day as part of our climate crisis, and that's just the work that we do. So let's dig into this policy a little bit more. It's called Carbon Fee and Dividend. Now, carbon fee and dividend uh, is very simple to explain. So uh, what we do is we assess a fee uh, when we dig up oil out of the ground or if we import coal from another country, we gather all that money together and then we divide that money between all American citizens. So if you dig it up out of the ground or you import it from anywhere, uh, a fee will be assessed based on how much carbon will be emitted. All of those funds will be collected and distributed via the same mechanism as Social Security. So Americans will be getting checks from the government equal to the total of funds raised via this mechanism. Now you might be thinking to yourself, uh, this might be disadvantageous or this might hurt American manufacturers or American exporters. Well, in order to address that, there's a carbon border adjustment. So if somebody is from the US is going to export something abroad, in order for them to successfully compete against countries that might not have a carbon price, uh, we will give those exporters a refund. In addition, uh, in order for them to compete domestically, if they're trying to compete against countries that don't have a 
carbon price, uh, we're going to assess a fee on imported goods. So if they, someone makes steel in a country that doesn't have a carbon price, if you import that steel, we're going to assess a fee on that steel uh, that's, that reflects how much carbon was emitted to create that steel. So who supports this policy? Now, the usual suspects, right? We got Janet Yellen. Uh, the current Secretary of the Treasury, Mitt Romney, the scientific community, the world at large, uh, and in fact, eight out of the 10 wealthiest countries on the planet already have a price for carbon. Um, but there are some people that support it that you might not think would support it. The US Chamber of Commerce, the American Petroleum Institute, the Electronic Power Association, uh, and the Business Roundtable. These organizations represent companies like British Petroleum and Shell. Even they realize it's time for a sensible solution to climate change. Now, this policy is projected, projected to get the US to net zero by 2050. And it's not just good for climate, it's also good for the economy. The resulting innovation from this policy will reduce our pollution fast and efficiently leading to a reliable and affordable clean energy system and modern lives. It will create green jobs through solar panel installation and retrofitting. And it's not just good for the economy, it's good for our health. Um, a lot of people are negatively infected by the combustion of petrochemicals. This policy will improve health and save American lives by reducing pollution Americans breathe. In fact, poor air quality is responsible for the deaths of as many as one in 10 Americans today and sickens thousands more. Now, as well as being good for health, it's good for our families. The money collected from this fee is given as a monthly payment to every American to spend with no restrictions. Especially after the pandemic, we know how helpful direct payments can be to protect vulnerable members of our society. Now, all of those projections have to be compared to the alternative, which is doing nothing, surrendering to he the heating of our planet and subjecting people like me and the children and grandchildren of people listening to this call to a lower quality of life than our parents. CCL and carbon dividend can work. It's revenue neutral, it's bipartisan, and it's why I'm here and it's why you should be too. Thanks for your time. Now, Kara Lopez Lee will share her perspective on climate policy. She is an author and former journalist here to represent our friends in CCL Ventura chapter. Kara? Thanks so much, John. So, my husband and I moved to Ventura in 2015 to a house within biking distance of all of our daily routines. I figured we'd stay in shape and fight climate change. Look, I know that two bikes are not going to save the world, but I figured if we're not part of the solution, then we're part of the problem. So my husband regularly bikes to work. No, he does not work at the beach. Um, I work at home, but I bike to many of my daily errands. And we both love to bike on the weekends to visit our ocean. Yes, our ocean. I name everything I love this way. Our promenade, our sunset. because because I love it, I also pay special attention to the erosion that is affecting our promenade because I know that this could all be underwater in my lifetime. So because I like biking, let's use that as a starting point to consider policy. So if everyone with the ability to do so were to bike more and drive less, it would actually have a huge impact on carbon dioxide emissions. But that's a tough sell because our lives are structured around fossil fuels. So how do we untangle ourselves from this structure? Well, regulations have already been a big help, um, but for every regulation that gets passed, many problems remain. So say we regulate tailpipe emissions, but maybe our cars still get lousy mileage. So we increase mileage or give people rebates for buying an electric car, but that doesn't affect power plants. Okay, so we regulate those, but that still leaves tons of petroleum products from polyester to plastic. Okay, you get the idea. Regulations are piecemeal. Each piece takes time and climate scientists say we may have fewer than 10 years to act. 
uh, regulations are also tough to implement, requiring new bureaucracy and enforcement, and they're vulnerable to political change. So if President Biden were to enact every environmental regulation possible, it will still be vulnerable to the next president who decides that regulations are bad for business. Think about the past four years, uh, how so many regulations have been un unraveled that have protected our air and water for decades. So this is why we at Citizens Climate Lobby prefer a legislative solution. And we actually agree with a leading economists who say that the most important part of any legislation is going to be to put a price on carbon. And that's why we promote carbon fee and dividend, which is currently best embodied by the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. Basically, you charge fossil fuel companies a steadily rising price on carbon, then return the money to households as dividends so Americans can spend it as they see fit. We see this market-based solution as a lever with the power to propel action on every front. Some of the benefits, uh, well, it will correct a market imbalance in that you know, fossil fuel prices have never really reflected their true cost to us all, which has slowed down change. And it will be fair because everybody gets the same size dividend, which is great for low to middle income households who tend to use less carbon, but suffer more from climate change. And it has broad support, including the American Petroleum Institute, which has just come out in support of this. Because look, okay, if you decide that you don't like it because you think big oil loves it, remember, keep in mind that the reason that they like this policy is because they're coming to grips with the fact that the fossil fuel era is over. They just need a policy that will help them plan. And remember, it's easier to get conservatives to back a market-based solution. And we're going to need bipartisan support to avoid a protracted fight. Moving fast has never been more important. I I've been wanting to move fast ever since the night I took this picture of the Thomas fire uh, in 2017, coming over the hillside to devour homes just six blocks from our house. When we evacuated, I didn't even look back because it felt like admitting that I was afraid I'd never see my house again. Our house still stands, but that disaster burned the truth into me that the climate emergency is now. That's another reason I like carbon fee and dividend because it has the power to be fast as well as effective and durable. Fast because it won't need, we won't need new regulations, new bureaucracy. This carbon price will catapult the market into action basically motivating companies to create products that are more sustainable and motivating the rest of us to buy them. It'll be effective because it'll affect more than 80% of emissions at a single stroke and durable because it will be a law. As much as we've seen that regulations can be vulnerable, we've seen that laws can be quite durable. Think of how hard the anti-Obamacare crowd tried to repeal that one, but it still stands. So look, the good news is that there are hundreds of climate change solutions all around us from alternative energy to habitat restoration. This habitat restoration project's in my own yard. So we just need a big push to ramp it all up. And climate fee and dividend, or excuse me, carbon fee and dividend is the big push. And when it does pass, I plan to go to Surfers Point on a bike with my husband to celebrate. For us, it's just another day in paradise, but I believe that's the point. Thank you. Now, Dennis Thompson will talk about opportunities for taking action. Dennis is an architect and longtime environmental community leader. Dennis? Thanks, John. Um, you know, I think we all know that climate change is a huge issue and that it needs action at all levels. Like Kara said, at the personal level, at the local level, and at the state level. But we at Citizens Climate Lobby believe that the biggest impact can be made at the national level, where we can move the whole country and inspire the world. Now, we've told you about carbon fee and dividend. It's effective at slowing climate change. It protects and even helps low and middle income citizens. And because it's bipartisan, it's durable and it can withstand the changes of national leadership. And you've heard about our CCL chapter here in Santa Barbara. We feel that while all kinds of actions are needed, our approach is to be inside the halls of Congress, 
as you can see from this screenshot of our, our most recent meeting with our member of Congress, uh, Salud Carvajal. At least three volunteers meet with each member of Congress at least twice a year. That's each member of Congress, whether they're favorable or not to climate change solutions. We are like water dripping on the stones. We're consistent, we're thoughtful, and we're constantly optimistic. So in addition to lobbying Congress, we work with social and traditional media to get our message to the public. And we make grassroots presentations like this one. Grass tops means working to gain the endorsements of carbon fee and dividend from prominent local groups like the CEC, Community Environmental Council, COAST, the AIA, uh, the Bicycle Coalition, and the World Business Academy, among others who have endorsed the policy. We've also uh, received the endorsement of individuals, prominent individuals like Mayor Kathy Murillo, uh, Lois and Laura Capps, Paul Rellis, uh, Supervisor Joan Hartman, and Mark McGinnis. So we do think this is the year for climate action and it's time for you to take the action now. Uh, if you'd like to join us, sign up uh, and visit the website citizensclimatelobby.org. You'll find out all about Citizens Climate Lobby and you'll stay informed about our activities. You can certainly email your member of Congress to support the Energy Innovation Act. That's House Resolution 2307. They always need to hear about constituent support. And you're welcome to follow us on Facebook. We're Citizens Climate Lobby, Santa Barbara chapter. So we'd love to have you join us in our effort to combat climate change.